All right, hi there. My name is Ethan Moore, and I'm here doing at Bat Breakdown episode four with the legendary Coach Jerry Weinstein. Coach, thank you for joining me. Ethan, my pleasure. All right, so today we are going to uh, break down a series of at bats between the Arizona Diamondbacks and Archie Bradley and the St. Louis Cardinals towards the end of the season. This was uh, September 25th, uh, late in the game. This is the situation here. Um, Archie Bradley just entered the game with one out and a runner on first and third. So um, we are going to get into this. So, Coach, will you please take me through um, when you're trying to figure out what pitch to throw and, um, you know, how to get out of this game with, with a win, um, how do you go about doing that? Well, everything is very specific to the pitcher and the situation. Number one, you need to realize that this is a safe situation for him. And he's their closer because the tying run is in the on-deck circle. So I think that is significant with runners on first and third base. Because closers, especially back-end guys, especially closers, pitch a lot better when they're in a closed situation. But basically, he's pitching this run to get three outs before they get four runs. So it's almost like this situation becomes no one on base. I'm not situationally pitching here. I'm trying to get this hitter out, the next hitter out, and the next hitter or however many hitters before, uh, before they score four runs. All right. So um, before we get started and into looking into the actual video of what's happened, um, we've gone over a little bit of scouting information. So um, it's obviously important when you're calling pitches to know what pitches uh, the pitcher throws, right? So um, what were the – you asked me a couple questions before we got um, recording here, but what are the types of things that you're looking for um, that you want to know about the pitcher when you're calling pitches? Well, I want to know the pitcher's strengths because overwhelmingly I'm going to pitch call to the pitcher's strengths as opposed to the hitter's weaknesses. And uh, I'm not going to ask the pitcher to do something they can't do, and I'm not afraid of pitching to the hitter's strengths with the pitcher strengths. I'd much rather go strength against strength than weakness against weakness. And the reality is that in most cases, you get the hitters out with their pitches. You take a guy like Albert Pools, and he's the best fastball hitter of our generation, yet 50% of his outs are on fastballs. Uh, ideally, uh, you throw it within their swing zone, outside their solid contact zone, but I know if I throw him his pitch, there's a good chance he's going to fire on it. And unless he has two strikes on him and I'm going to freeze him with strike three, uh, that if I get him his bat started, there's a good opportunity for me to get him out because the reality is in professional baseball and big league baseball, 68% of fairly hit balls are outs. And even balls that are scalded that are hit hard, 42% of them are outs. Gotcha. So when you're talking about, um, you know, pitching to a pitcher's strength, um, it seems to me that they're – uh, you know, there's such a, a huge emphasis in uh, within Major League Baseball teams on advanced scouting and figuring out, you know, a, a hitter's tendencies. So are you throwing all of that out the window or, or, or just using that as kind of um, details? Well, uh, obviously they're big league pitchers and they're, they're not one-trick ponies. It's not like they can only do one thing and they have a – they're diverse in, in their tool set relative to what pitch they can throw to what situation. It's not like, hey, I only have one pitch and I can only throw it into one location. And, you know, they have more than one pitch. They have an arsenal that complements one another. So, obviously, if we can go strength against weakness or even, you know, like I said, I'm not – it's usually when you get beat, it's because of the quality of the pitch, not because you threw the wrong pitch. It's usually based on location or just plain poor execution. Okay, interesting. Um, so, yeah, so what we found here um, in breaking down how Archie Bradley pitches against um, righties and lefties, in this inning he faces both righties and lefties. Um, so he, he, in both cases, is throwing his fastball most often, his curveball second most often. He throws the sinker almost exclusively um, to righties, and he throws this changeup almost exclusively to lefties. Um, I have a little plot here that I made up um, – about this, the red dots are change-ups and the blue dots are um, two-seam fastballs and these are on, on the ground balls he gets. So um, that's just something to keep an eye out for during this at-bat for uh, the viewer who, you know, might be playing along at home. So, um, Coach, hey, if it's right with if you. If I could just interject one thing. 
Sure. Uh, just based on, and, and we talked about Archie before. I don't know Archie Bradley that well, but, and I asked you the percentage of the pitches that he throws. Well, 84% of his pitches are either going to be a four seam fastball or a curveball. He throws a very low percentage change up 6% and only 11% sinkers to right handers. So when the game's on the line, he's going to primarily go to, well, pretty much four seam fastball. He throws twice as many four seam fastballs as he does. Uh, knuckle curveballs. I'm guessing that his knuckle curveball is more of a put away pitch that he uses to finish hitters out, especially when he's ahead in the count or they have two strikes on him. Yeah. All right. All something to to keep in mind. So, um, are you ready to get into the footage? You bet. All right. So here is Archie Bradley's first pitch. Do you have any uh, any idea of what you think you would be calling here? No, absolutely. Um, we've got a four run lead with runners on first and third. I'm about attacking this hitter. And so <clears throat> ideally I'm going to throw my highest percentage strike pitch to my highest percentage location. Cause overwhelmingly, uh, first pitch strikes are extremely important in, in big league baseball, only seven to eight percent of first pitch strikes, uh, become hits. They're either foul balls, they're outs, uh, or they're called strikes or, or swung at and missed. So, uh, but with that being said, my guess is in this situation, uh, and not knowing a lot about this hitter, I would say kind of moderately aggressive because, uh, what his, what his job is and every hitter as they come up is to make sure, uh, in this situation as a team, your goal is to make sure you get the tying run up to the plate, uh, during this inning. So he's more or less a table center trying to get on base. So it's probably 50, 50. Uh, depending upon uh, what his, his success rate is on an OO pitch, whether he swings at this pitch or not. My guess is that, especially with Bradley coming in and uh, not knowing uh, what kind of command he's going to have, uh, unless this guy is, is really committed, really successful hitting first pitch, that he might be taking this pitch. So I'm going to basically throw a four-seam fastball down over the middle of the plate here would be – in, with the knowledge that I have right now sitting here at my desk. All right. So, yeah, um, usually in these videos I try to uh, figure out, you know, what the hitter's tendencies might be. Uh, this particular hitter had almost no major league experience before this. So, uh, yeah, that's why uh, you and me are on the same page knowing nothing about this hitter. But, uh, but let's see what happens here. All right, yeah, so so he went with the fastball. No, I'm, I'm getting blocked out here a little bit about, oh, okay. So, all right, now, I didn't really see that pitch, but. Uh, okay, here, I'll ball. play it again. I'll play it again. Right. Sure. Were you able to see that one? Yeah, to me, I don't, I don't like the catcher setup on that. Interesting. Because, because if you see where he's setting up, if you play it back, okay, He's sitting up arm side in, and this looks this looked very much like a two seam fastball. So if this guy if he starts the ball at his target at the catcher's target, which is in, it's probably going to run in off the plate based on what the expected uh, uh, arm side run or sink that that we would normally get from this particular location. For me, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to want to set up more over the middle of the plate and down. And basically, what happened here? He started the ball towards his glove, and it had movement. And it ran in off the plate and, and was a ball, correct? Yeah. Yep, you you nailed it. Um, all right. So, yeah, and then like you were talking about, um, we're not sure how Bradley's command is going to be as soon as he comes in. And, um, you know, it looks like it wasn't great there. So, um, all right. So, we knowing what you know about that pitch, um, what are you thinking about now? Well, now I'm hoping the catcher sets up a little more towards the middle of the plate or even <laughs> towards his extension side. And I'm going to go back and throw another fastball. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a four or two seam fastball because I, I don't I haven't seen Bradley throw that much. But the action was more of a two seam fastball with the the arm side sinkage there. But uh, for me right now, uh, 93 mile an hour average big league velo, but really good movement there. If I throw this same pitch over the plate and down, I have every reason to expect a ground ball, maybe even a double play. All right, let's keep an eye on the catcher's setup here. Okay, so 
What did you see there that kept from the catcher? Well, he started um, more towards the middle, and it looked like it was a four-seam fastball outside instead of a two-seam fastball inside here. So, you know, not a bad location on the pitch if I can try to find – yeah, not a bad location. Um, but well, I'm curious. Well, in that's, what you that's, that's the adjustment. You know, he, 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 he had a lot of run and sink on the first two-seamer. Then he went right back to a four-seamer to the extension side. And uh, I think for me right now, I would stay on that extension side from a target standpoint, but maybe go back to, to his two-seam fastball. Would you be trying to kind of start it like off the plate and have it cut back in? No, I want – no, because if I do that, I want this guy swinging the bat here. So if I throw a, uh, a comeback two-seamer, one that comes back to the plate, chances are he's going to take it yeah. because it, it starts it, – it become it goes from a ball to a strike. I want this – I want this pitch ideally to start in the strike zone and stay in the strike zone because I want him to fire. I want him swinging the bat in this situation. But, okay, but you want it to be kind of in the in the bottom part of the zone so that if he does swing, it's not um, a, a solid hit, right? Well, if he's throwing a two-seamer, you definitely want it down because he'd like to have a ground ball in this situation and, uh, and, and hopefully turn a double play. But remember, his number one goal – is to get this hitter out and not so much pitch to the first and third situation and ground ball. But again, based on how he threw the first two seamer and how he threw the four seamer, I, I like the, the two seamer, but target more middle or towards uh, his extension side, towards his glove side. All right. All right. Well, not, not a big fan of that pitch right there. <laughs> what do you and, think? And, and the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because, again, this is a, especially with the situation, the score and everything, uh, I, I'm guessing that he throws breaking ball. It's more of a swing and miss pitch, especially for a late season call-up guy. I'd almost like to save that pitch as my put-away pitch with two strikes. And I would guess that his percentage, his strike percentage uh, – with his curveball is lower than a strike percentage with either his two seamer or his four seamer. So now I'm back into uh, uh, four seam fastball mode, maybe two seam, but based on the percentage that he throws at two seam, I would say four seam. I might shake off a couple of times to get the guys thinking a little bit, you know, and maybe come off the fastball uh, where in terms of what he's looking for, but I'm going to throw a, a four seam fastball here down somewhere down and over the plate. I love the fake shake. I love that. All right. Okay. Again, for me, a bad target. He threw a two-seamer, and he basically threw it where the target was. It wasn't down enough, but what happened? It was basically at the target, and now what happened? Watch the, watch the movement. The movement takes the ball out of the strike zone, and it's a ball. Yeah. I want the ball to start out a strike and stay in the strike zone as a strike because I want him swinging. All right, so now I'm back in a in kind of a, a leverage situation, and uh, I'm, I, I need I need to have this guy swing the bat here. If this guy hits a three run home run here, I can live with that. I need I need this I need to have contact here, and so now I'm back to a quality four seam fastball down over the middle of the plate or even to the extension side, but it's got to end up in the strike zone here because I can't count on the guy not swinging and having it called a ball. All right. Mm. Okay, four-seam fastball, and he yanked it and missed. Now, his is this, Go ahead. I, I was going to ask, so um, at this point, you know, when, when a guy goes 3-1 or, you know, a five-pitch walk here, you'd think – you know, the casual fan would say that that pitcher is struggling with command. Um, at this point, I mean, that last pitch, he, he clearly was not aiming for that. Um, but it seemed like a couple of the other balls, he kind of put it um, around where he wanted to. So would you say right now that, that you'd be concerned about Bradley's command after this at bat? No, because the only pitch he didn't command, well, really the only pitch he didn't command was the last fastball that he yanked. You know, and basically, you know, it's almost like, hey, I – I can't walk this guy, and the next thing you know, you end up yanking one and walking the guy. For me, I don't like the, the setups, and 
again, and this is just me looking at a video uh, uh, a long distance away from this situation, but uh, the two, two seamers he threw were really not that awfully bad, but the target was bad. And uh, I don't like targeting inside, arm side, or even away from a lefty with two seamers because they, they end up running out of the strike zone. And this is a situation where he, he needed to roll, rely on his stuff, which is plenty good enough, and rely on the rule of 68. And uh, so I don't like the 2-1 curveball, and I don't like the, the setups for the two seamers, the first one, and then that 2-1 that two, uh, two seamer. So I don't know much about um, catcher setups, and that's not something that I've thought too much about. Can you give me a couple kind of rules of thumb for um, how to – you know, spot a good setup or a bad setup? Well, setups are all based on what the, the pitcher needs to execute his pitch. And for me, the, the arm side setup for those two seamers did not give him a chance to, to have enough of the strike zone to, to land the ball in the strike zone. All right. Sweet. So um, after the walk, coming up next, we have switch hitting uh, catcher Matt Weeters. So um, just as a refresher, Matt Wieters is, um, well, Archie Bradley against lefties is probably not going to be throwing that two-seam fastball at all. He um, may now be throwing that changeup, um, but still going to be predominantly fastball, uh, curveball. So, um, so, yeah, how has the situation changed here from a pitch-calling perspective? Well, the situation still hasn't changed a whole lot because you have a four-run lead. And basically, uh, it, you're just counting the outs. And so if he gets Weeders out and then he gets uh, Goldschmidt out next and the next guy, and even if all three runs score, you win nine to eight. And his job is to make sure he leaves the mound uh, and they win. And uh, so for me, this is – I'm going to pitch Weeders just like I'd pitch Weeders if there were nobody on base. Now, would I like a ground ball here? Yeah, fine. But I'm not going to try and manipulate the ball and create movement or be so fine – that I get behind in the count and he gets a, a cookie to hit and all of a sudden you got the tying run and scoring position. I'm going to make sure that, again, strike one, that uh, he swings a bat, that it's just about me getting this hitter out and not, and not worrying about the base runners in this situation. All right, so during the first at bat in a similar situation, you called for um, the four-seam fastball, you know, the highest strike percentage pitch at the bottom of the zone. Is that what we're going with here? Well, you know, one of the things that you would think that Weeders has got a little power here, and he's firing on this first pitch, and so which yeah. is fine, which is fine for me. So for me, the highest percentage strike pitch is highest percentage location. Hopefully, you have two pitches. Uh, Bradley seems like just watching what he's got today, command wise, uh, uh, his best command was probably the the four seam fastball. But uh, I could live with a two or four seam fastball as long as the setup was on the two-seamer was more towards uh, uh, his glove side. So either either one of those two. And, um, you know, even the changeup is not a bad pitch here in this situation because he's going to be aggressive. He's going to try and, he's gonna try and, and uh, impact this ball here and hit a ball in the gap somewhere or, or out of the ballpark. Uh, so he's not just – this isn't just going to be a put-the-ball-in-play swing. It's going to be aggressive. So – uh, I, you have an option line, probably four seam fastball would be number one, two seam fastball would be number two, and change up would be number three. But I'm at a deficit here because I don't know his strike percentages uh, for any one of those pitches. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what we have here. Mm. All right. Now, see, there, there, that's problematic again for me. I was going to say, even I noticed the bad setup there. I mean, we've just walked the guy. we got the tying runner up. Uh, first pitch strikes are really important for me. Four seam fastball, and he basically, he basically hits his target. But you can see his target is off the plate yeah. by a, glove, a glove's width. And he's kind of angled his setup a little bit where the umpire can really see the outside. Now, that might have been a two-seam or two. It had a little late run, but most likely it was a four-seamer. Just for me, uh, he's basically pitch calling his pitcher into trouble here, in my opinion. Just And, again, all opinion. 
you know, obviously, I don't know who this is that's catching, but obviously he knows his pitcher better than I know the pitcher, and, and uh, maybe it's just he, he can execute these pitches but uh, is not doing it right now. But just overall, uh, for me, we're pitching awfully fine in a situation where we shouldn't be. Gotcha. Um, all right, so please take me through uh, what you're thinking on this next pitch here. Well, I'm thinking that and this better be a four-seam fastball over the plate. The key we should watch is setup. All right, yeah, so let's watch the setup. Uh, let me just say one thing that one of the things that, uh, you, you know, the, the reality is that big league pitchers only hit their targets with fastballs 24% of the time. So when they miss, you want to make sure that, they have enough room within the strike zone based on where the target is that it could still be in the strike zone. And when you start going from corner to corner and they miss, generally they miss out of the strike zone. Gotcha. That makes sense. All right. So we'll pause here on the setup. To me, uh, too fine, but hopefully, you know, and this guy's a premium big league pitcher. And, and when I ask him to throw a, a one Oh fastball and I'll, uh, outer half, but this to me is a little bit more extreme than the outer half. I'd like to see him set up more of the plate, but let's see what happens. All right. <laughs> he nails it. Yeah, four seam fastball. Okay. All right. Uh, Did just what he wanted to do. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that you try, you know, one of the axioms in, in professional baseball is. Uh, you try not to go in late because when you go in late, if the guy gets his barrel out, there's a chance he can leave the ballpark. If, they, if they're going to beat you, if it's the tying or go-ahead run, generally they like to uh, force them to beat you towards the, to the opposite field. The only problem with that is the hitters know that too, especially Weeters, who's a catcher. And so now there's a good chance he's eliminated the inner half of the plate, and he's pretty much – committed to something away, which is okay because we got the rule of 68 working for us. My guess after throwing that pitch that he comes back and throws another four-seamer, pretty much the same spot. Real quick, when you say um, you don't want to go in late, does that mean late in the count or late in the game? Late late in the game. Late okay. The game. Got you. Okay, well, here we are. 1-1 um, one, one count. Let's see what happens here. Okay, that looked like might have been a changeup. I think it was. Uh, which is kind of odd to me in that situation. Uh, and, and also not knowing what his strike percentage is, but uh, the breakdown on his pitch is he throws his changeup 6% of the time, mostly to left-handers. And that tells me that it's really not, it's really not a usable pitch for him because of the the uh, the number of the percentage of time that he throws it. Uh, yeah. So again, he's throwing a pitch that is not one of his highest percentage strike pitches. So now, uh, now I'm in a vulnerable situation. I'm gonna the hitter's gonna get his pitch probably in a situation where he doesn't have to swing at it if it's not there. So now it's a what do we got? We got a two one count. I yeah. guess he goes back with four seam fastball. All right. And he got a four seam fastball down over the middle of the plate. He sure did. And you know, you just A, you tip your hat to the to, to the hitter here. But also, uh, you, you've got to say that I put that guy in a count leverage situation where I put him in a, in a situation where he got his pitch out, of, you know, kind of middle out, which is what he was looking for. Yeah. And, and even though this is a quality pitch, it gets hit because uh, it's basically what he's looking for. I mean, that ball's down over the middle of the plate. That's a good pitch. Uh, I don't know what the below is, uh, but – it was 95. Yeah, and this, this guy's 
this guy's a big league hitter. <laughs> he's got a bat in his hand, and he's getting the pitch he's looking for pretty much uh, in the location, maybe down a little bit more than he would like, but it's out over the plate, and he's kind of anticipating balls away from him because that's what he's been seeing, and also the situation indicates that that Bradley does not want to go in and give him a chance to yank something down the line uh, to uh, uh, to tie the ball game. Yeah, I think that this individual pitch here really just highlights, you know, the importance of, of you know, the game within the game and, and understanding, um, you know, what what all goes into these pit, this, you know, pitch calling and, and, you know, the results you see on the field. So, you know, this is um, – a project that I did a little while ago where I was trying to find out, um, you know, trying to define pitch quality, talking about, you know, when a guy throws a pitch, is it a, on average, is it a good pitch or is it a bad pitch? And what I want to highlight here is with Bradley, his four seam fastball. So here red is good and, and blue is bad. Red, you know, this is not an awful place to be, right? This is from the pitcher's perspective, a, a low fastball, um, generally not a bad pitch to throw, but, when the hitter's looking for it, you know, that's going to be a hit that, that, um, you know, damage is done on. Right. So it's. Oh, no doubt. I, my point was that same pitch thrown in an OO count might have different results than that pitch thrown in a two, one count based on, uh, he sees the hitter before him with all the arm side misses and the mm-hmm. body command. And then now he's behind on him and the, the most success he's having is on balls away from him. And he's the tying run, and so now he's uh, he's pretty much sitting on that pitch, maybe not at that height, but certainly fastball down uh, or fastball out away from him. Yeah, that's so cool. All right, so um, the next batter up after that uh, single is is Paul Goldschmidt, who is probably not who Archie Bradley wants to see coming up um, in the box here um, as you know the go ahead run. So um, now that the run, the, the runners on base do matter. You know, in the last two at bats, the runners on base didn't really matter if they scored. You know, the Diamondbacks are still still winning, still comfortable. Um, so at this point, now is the pitch calling. Uh, do you think the, that the pitch calling should be a little bit more um, situational? Oh no doubt, <laughs> this guy can do some major damage, yeah. and he's the, go, he's the go-ahead run right here. So now, uh, and he's going to he's going to be firing. Uh, my guess is that that uh, Goldie's pretty aggressive first pitch. And, and so now uh, I've thrown an awful lot of fastballs uh, first pitch, and, and most of them have been arm side. I think probably what I'm going to try and do is, is uh, you know, roll the dice a little bit, and, and I'm either going to throw fastball away. Uh, it might be a two-seam comebacker, but most likely it's a four-seam away, or even start him with a with – a, uh, more of a get it over breaking ball. Unfortunately, the the knuckle curve ball is more of a power breaking ball, and and it's more of an in the zone and out of the zone pitch. But my guess is Goldie's pretty aggressive on this first pitch, and uh, so I've got. Uh, it's not going to probably not going to be the sinker, which runs down and in, and if he gets his barrel out, he's liable to leave the yard on it, and it's not going to be a changeup because he doesn't throw changeups to right-handers, and he only throws six percent. So for me, it's uh, you got. You got a two seamer away, but that's probably out of the out of the mix because most of his two seamers have been running into uh, towards his uh, arm side. So it's either going to be breaking ball or fastball away. All right. So the the last couple batters you talked about how um, you're not really looking for a ground ball. You're just trying to get the batter out however you can. Um, here is there more more emphasis on getting that ground ball or is it still just kind of trying to get this guy out any way you can? Well, Goldschmidt, you're, you're just happy if you get him out. If you get him out and he, he happens to advance a runner, that's fine. Or if he hits a deep fly ball and you end up with runners on first and third, you're okay. Uh, uh, but at, from the catcher's perspective and from the pitcher's perspective, this is now about he can't afford to, to try and – pitch to Goldschmidt's weaknesses necessarily because his command has been pretty spotty so far and he's just fighting like crazy just to get the ball to where he wants it to go. So again, this is about pitching to his pitch calling and pitching to your strengths in this situation. All right, sweet. Let's check it out. First pitch. Uh, 
Uh, there's that inside setup for that two seamer and ran out of the. And I'm not even sure if it's a, a two seamer. That might just be his four seamer that that uh, had, had a lot of run to it. And, and maybe when he's on his arm side, you know, it has a lot more movement. But again, uh, he's going in, which. But the end is a little elevated in. It's not down and in. So for me, going in a little bit elevated is okay. But every I, at this point, every time I've set up in for a fastball, it's run off the plate, which it does again here. Yep. Um, I think that with Bradley, typically, if it's 93, it's a two seam. And if it's 94, 95, it's a four seam. So that's kind of how I've been um, looking at that. So I, I do think that that was a two seam um, inside, which is, yeah, interesting here. So you're down 1-0 here, you know, didn't get that first pitch strike. Um, now is it just kind of got to throw a four seam? Uh, to me, it's four seam away. That's my kind of my default position. And hopefully it's a fly ball to right field. All right. Wow. Uh, outstanding curveball. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a great pitch. Yeah, that's why, and that's why he's a big league pitcher too, because he's not a he's not a one trick pony, and and uh, basically that's a swing and miss breaking ball. So that that changes the equation a little bit for the hitter, because uh, that's only the second breaking ball he's throwing, the first one for a strike. Uh, but he's throwing a lot of fastballs for balls, so that you know would stand to reason what the heck, what do I got to lose here by throwing a breaking ball? And now uh, in the pitcher catcher mindset is. Uh, how did the pitcher throw that pitch? How did the hitter react to that pitch? And where do I think the hitter's attention zone is going on this next pitch? And uh, my guess is that Goldie is looking kind of middle out. And uh, I think the option line is, uh, I think you got three, I think you got three, three options here. It could be four seam fastball away, could be four seam fastball in that's a little bit elevated or back to the breaking ball on any one of those three. If you locate it and execute it, it's probably a good option. There isn't one perfect pitch. All right. Um, I, I want to play the, the last pitch back a second. I want to get your thoughts on, you know, if we look at the batter for this pitch, um, can we get a sense for what Goldschmidt was sitting on or what he might have been expecting? Because we, we see that he swung at the curveball, um, but what do you see about his swing that might indicate – whether he was ready for the curveball and just missed it, or whether he was sitting fastball and sitting curveball, or sitting fastball and, and having to adjust to the curveball. Um, I'll play it again and, and then see what you think about that. Well, <laughs> to me, he didn't see curveball out of the hand. That's a tight, there's no loop to that curveball. That's a tight downer curveball. And I'm sure he read fastball out of the hand uh, and didn't pick up the curveball and was totally committed to fastball. So he may have been thinking that it was going to be kind of a, an elevated fastball and then the bottom just dropped out. Right. No, no question. You know, he, and, and in that situation, you're not thinking that you're totally committed to one pitch. He's sitting on a pitch most likely I would guess without knowing what his strategy is. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on one Oh, it makes sense to be sitting on that fastball. I mean, it seems like that's what we were expecting uh, the pitch to be thrown as well. So, um, all right. So here we are. Will you, um, Sorry, will you run back the option line here for um, this 1-1 one, one pitch? Well, uh, number one, four-seam fastball away. Number two, breaking ball. And then uh, maybe a fastball a little bit elevated on the belt line, possibly. Uh, not likely throwing a two-seamer here to me. All right. Okay, so we threw him a four-seam fastball down, middle out, and uh, – Let's try to find it here. Yeah. So, yeah, really not a, not a bad pitch location, yeah. it seems to me. No, 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 that's, that, that's a good pitch. But – and, again, it was more in kind of middle in, and uh, Goldie didn't, didn't, quite, didn't quite get the barrel out there and – kind of uh, rolled over the top of it. And, you know, I, I mean, that's where, I mean, that's, that's not an unhittable pitch. What was the below on that? 94. And, 
you know, he just missed it, you know, and that's where that rule of 68 comes in. And it's almost like, you know, I talked to guys about if, if you were a casino, you'd be the house and the house always wins. So mm-hmm. if you can get the got to put the ball in play based on the rule of 68, the, the odds are pretty good at, that you're going to get them out a uh, high percentage of the time. And so this was a percentage play. Goldie's a great fastball hitter. This is probably a fastball that's a lot of times he might hit, but he doesn't hear and uh, they turn a double play. Will you, well, I've, I've already asked you this, but for the viewers, will you please define the rule of 68 for us? 68% of all fairly hit balls in the big leagues are outs. The average uh, on-base percentage in the big leagues is 320. Gotcha. All right. So that's, the idea is that you can, you can get away with um, pitches that are maybe suboptimal because even – even, you know, major league hitters are going to get themselves out a lot of the times when they put it in play. Well, don't say that to a major league pitcher. <laughs> they get them out, they'll take credit for getting them out, and they should. You know, I, I don't – I think <laughs> the pitcher has a lot to do with getting hitters out and uh, hitters, you know, not necessarily getting themselves out. And I, I give the credit to the, to the battery, the pitcher, that when they get them out, they did something right to get them out. All right. Awesome. Well – um, so that's the, the final result of this game. Uh, Goldsmith grounds into this double play. Um, game ends and the, the Diamondbacks win 9-7. Um, to seven. So do you have any final thoughts on um, this game or just pitch calling in general that, um, that you want to share with us before we say goodbye? Well, I would just, you know, just for me, uh, and again, it's very pitcher dependent, but when I'm throwing two seamers, I, I try and stay more middle of the plate for me target-wise. But obviously, uh, obviously, uh, uh, he was comfortable with that setup, and they they worked together before. And so Bradley, you know, he's in charge of, of what he's going to throw and where the guy's going to set up. So obviously, he likes that setup. And maybe this is just one of those days that he wasn't able to execute his pitches. His timing was off a little bit, and his arm was a little bit late, and he had more run than he normally does, whether it was a two-seam or a four-seam. Uh, but uh, he did what he was supposed to do. You know, he, he got three outs before they got four runs. And and uh, I think that from a team standpoint, that, that that's, what we're asking, that's what we're asking the guy to do. Not not to be a perfect pitcher, not to go out there and, and not give up any runs in that situation. Because uh, as soon as you start doing that, then you end up, pitching behind in the count and trying to be a perfect pitcher and there's no such thing. All right. Um, and again, before we go, would you mind giving a little bit of advice for um, someone who might be college pitches for the first time, say at, at the high school or the college level or, or someone like me who's just trying to learn more about it, just a little bit of advice from, from your experience? Well, overwhelmingly, the number one most important thing is pitch, to, pitch call to your, your pitcher's strength. And if you're a pitcher, pitch to your strengths. Don't try to be. Don't try to be a magician out there. If you have, if I were a catcher or or I were a, I were a pitcher. Let's say you're a catcher and you're calling pitches, and I had this unbelievable scouting report on the other team, and I knew the other team better than their coach knew their team. And then on the flip side, I didn't know the other team at all, but I know my pitcher backwards and forwards. I know what he can do. Overwhelmingly, I think I'd be more successful if I were able to pitch call for a pitcher that I knew versus a team that I knew. All right. Sweet. All right, coach. Thank you very much for, for taking the time out and imparting your wisdom uh, on us here. So um, yeah, just thank you very much.